that you're here. If you are a visitor with us, we are especially glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, we'd like to extend a special welcome to you. Um, we also ask that you fill out the visitor's card in the pre-rack in front of you. If you'll fill that out and put that in the offering plate later in service, um, we can reach out to you, um, give you a little bit more information about our wonderful church here and our church family, and also get some more information from you. Um, there are quite a few announcements, so if you guys will open your bulletins and follow along. Um, the 2017 contribution statements and 2018 offering envelopes are available for pickup. Those are in the gathering area. The Perry County Mission Trip is March 10th through the 13th. Please see more info in the bulletin, but do note that there are pre-trip meetings that will be held February 11th and 25th at 11.30 following late worship. The DR Mission Trip Lunch is today at 11.30 in the Youth Room. Ladies Night Out will meet this Tuesday the 5th at Rosie's on Highway 72 at 6 p.m. TU classes, remaining dates um, to meet are February 18th, 25th, and March 4th. The classes are all at 6 p.m., and you can check your bulletin for more details on where in the church those classes meet. Our Valentine Banquet is coming up. We have our Valentine Banquet next Sunday on the 11th from 5 to 7. There will be great music, um, really good food, um, and it's just a great way to fellowship with other um, church members. As well, um, the youth will be serving that night, so any tips um, that you um, care to give will go to the youth accounts, and that will go towards their passport and fall retreat camping trips. The sign-up for that is in your Sunday school class, but it's also in the gathering area if you didn't get a chance to sign up in your Sunday school class. We will also have child care available that evening through sixth grade with pizza supper included for them. The Ash Wednesday service will be next Wednesday, the 14th at 6.15. Our Super Bowl party for the youth is tonight from 5 to 7. Um, the youth are asked to bring $5, their favorite chips or cookies. Um, we will have the um, game on the big screen in the youth room, plenty of wings and cheese dip. So anybody welcome, anybody in the church is welcome to come um, and hang out with us there. There will also be no praise team or choir practice tonight. Um, in an effort to um, continue to be mindful of the sickness and flu and everything else going around, I did tell the early service to throw elbows. So don't throw an elbow at anybody. Just bump elbows maybe um, or just wave um, for the passing of the peace. But if you guys will please join me now for that. Thank you. Way more chill. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning again. Thank you so much for being here today. Please join me now for a moment of prayer. Lord God, I ask that you bless us here today. I ask that you give us confidence that we so desperately need to be your hands and to be your feet. To shed your light to those around us and move those mountains that you put there for us, God. I pray these things in your name only. Amen. Let us now sing together our song of confession, Lord, I need you. You can find the words printed on the front of your worship order. I invite us now to please stand as we sing together.
Please be seated. The other day I was at the place I work out and uh, one of my friends and I were leaving the little area where there's the cardio and everything and we were walking down the hallway and I said, did you finish your workout? He said, yeah, but I'm going for a steam. Do you ever do a steam, Glenn? Y'all try the steam. And I said, I'm not really the steam kind of guy. No, I, I don't really do steams. He said, you need to try the steam. Steam's the best part of my day. I go in there and think about nothing. It's the best part of my day. Yeah. During Be Still and No, we don't invite you to sit here and think about nothing. <laughs> we do hope it's one of the better parts of your day, though. During Be Still and No, we hope you quiet your minds and your hearts and be still and open yourselves up to God speaking to you and listen to God and let God speak to you in a special way. Let's pray together at this time. Dear God, we're still and quiet so we can hear you more clearly. We celebrate your words coming to us. Thank you for comforting us when we hurt. We love and worship you today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture passage is from John chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, and then verses 27 through 30. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisee, what the Pharisees has heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired, went out by his journey, was sitting by the well, and it was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, Ask a drink of water for me, a woman of Samaria. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And then over to verse 27. Then Je when Jesus, just then Jesus' disciples came, they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left the water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He, can't, he cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way there to him. This is the word of the Lord. At this time, our pre-K and our kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship. As we sing together our hymn of mercy, hymn number 25, there's a wideness in God's mercy. Please stand as we sing together. in God's mercy like the wideness 
of the sea. There's a kindness in his justice, which is more than liberty. There is welcome for the sinner, and more graces for the good. There is mercy with the Savior, there is healing in his blood. But we make his love too narrow by false limits of our own, and we magnify his strictness with a zeal he will not own. For the love of God is broader, the measure of one's mind, and the heart of the eternal is more wonderfully kind. If our but more simple, we could take him at his word, and our lives would be more loving in the likeness of our Lord. Please be seated. Felix was a young boy and he was living with his family in Africa. Then a rebellion started. His family was on the wrong side of the rebellion, so they were arrested and Felix was the only one that survived. After fleeing to Nigeria and living there 12 years, he made his way to the United States. But Felix was alone, he did not speak the language and he was afraid. Felix said he felt like God was calling him to start a church for other people like himself. So with the help of CBF missionaries Mark and Kim Wyatt and the New Church Start initiatives, Felix started a church, a new church, for Swahili speakers looking for a new community. Felix said, what was my biggest hindrance, God has used to reach others. Let us pause for a moment and pray silently for Felix, this new congregation, and for Mark and Kim Wyatt. Amen.
It's a pretty song. Isn't it? Good morning. It's so good to see you here. I'm so appreciative of you uh, taking the time to come to church and making the choice to worship together with our friends here at Trinity. If you're a guest, we're particularly glad that you're here, and we always want you to know that you're welcomed uh, to join us. Uh, the passage we're going to look at today in John chapter 4 is a very long story. We only got to read selections of it. I encourage you, if you can, to go back and look at it sometime today or this week. Uh, chapter 4 of John, verses 1 through 42, the story of Jesus and his encounter with a woman at a well in ancient Samaria. I entitled my sermon, Let Go and Let God. And that's sort of like a little slogan maybe you've heard before. It's a little pithy saying, really. It's sort of small. But from the very beginning, us, we Christians have enjoyed having something small that encapsulates a little bit about what we believe, some of the complexities of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So we like things that are a little simpler to do that. Early Christians would greet each other, for example, as a way to identify each other with the simple words, Jesus is Lord. Have you heard that before? And that's sort of something that became part of early Christians and has lasted for us. We like symbols. Maybe you've seen the fish symbol, the ichthus symbol before. Sometimes we are told that early Christians in times of persecution would have a secret handshake and that would identify someone they could trust so they could put their hands together to form that little fish symbol. Can you see that? Maybe you could try that later on or with your partner or by yourself if you want to. Uh, the symbol of the cross is one of those that identified people as followers of Jesus in remembrance of His sacrifice. At Easter, we will proclaim with very simple words, He is risen, and the response from the congregation is, He is risen indeed. Those are words that are very important to us, but they speak a whole lot more than the shortness of their phrasing, right? Sometime, at some point in time, people began to put those uh, little sayings in different places like bumper stickers. Now, I didn't go around and look at the back of your cars in the parking lot. You might have a bumper sticker that has some kind of Christian saying or something on it. Here are a few that I found and I've seen through the years. You may have seen them before. You may have it on your car. One of them says, this car is prayer conditioned. Okay. Do you follow Jesus this close? <laughs> that was a good one. There you go. I like, this is one of my favorite ones, Armageddon out of here. Armageddon, out, well anyway. <laughs> Today's forecast, Jesus reigns, okay? Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> Don't let my car fool you, my treasure's in heaven. Don't give up, Moses was once a basket case too. And then a good one, Don't be a bumper sticker Christian. Well, these are all little pithy sayings, and we like them. And some of them are very, very important to us, and they mean a lot to us. They express our hopes, our faith, and they're simple. We can easily hide it in our hearts. God is in control. has always been one that I've liked a lot. Jesus loves you and me. It's very simple. Attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God. Uh, God is good all the time, and all the time. God is good. Those are very special words for us. And some people will take parts of Bible verses or these slogans and tattoo them to themselves. I saw a player for, I think, Texas this week, and he was flexing after he dunked, and, he, and it had on his arms, God's child. But that was pretty neat. Sometimes we cross-stitch them and we hang them up on our walls in our dining room or our living room or something. They're on bookmarks. We post it on Facebook. It's a screensaver. All kinds of stuff. When I was in college, we tried these little tracks, little pamphlets of paper that you could give to somebody. It was a simple way to share what you believed. And it was a few pages. Eight steps to becoming a Christian. Four steps to peace with God. There was a little one that I saw once. It was about how you could share your faith so you could read it and understand it. And it was something like, how to share your faith with unbelievers without freaking them out. That was actually the title of this little pamphlet. St. Patrick of Ireland used a clover leaf to explain the complexities of the trinity of God. The little three-leaf clover. Three in one. God in three persons. One of my favorites when I was in college was 
the bridge illustration. It's a picture of a sort of a chasm or a gulf or something. On one side is, is us and the other side is God. Sin is something we've created that separated us from God. And Jesus lays himself down over that, over the sin, and allows us to have a way to connect with God directly. Have you seen those things before? My granddaddy told me when I was first starting out that you should always try to preach in such a way that it's simple enough that even a child could understand it. We've got a big game tonight. Some of you might be watching. Somebody told me earlier the Puppy Bowl is, is on, so I know that's what y'all were thinking. I'm excited about the Puppy Bowl. But anyway, if you're going to watch a big game, I thought about Herm Edwards, who's now the football coach at Arizona State University. Some years ago, he was the head football coach of the New York Jets. And after a loss, he was at his press conference. He was pretty uptight about it. And the people, somebody asked him, aren't you proud of your team? You're making a lot of progress. And he, sa he was basically saying, it's not about losing, it's about winning. He said, this sports is very simple. It's about winning the game. Hello, you play to win the game. You can go to YouTube. It's got like thousands of hits. It's a big thing that he did. And, and we like that. Something simple. Just state the fact, what it is, and we like to boil things down so we can understand them a little better. Sometimes we want to boil down our theology. What do we think about God? Put it in a nutshell so I can handle it a little better. Somebody did once say, uh, some preacher I heard many years ago, if you can put your theology in a nutshell, it probably belongs there. So just be aware of that. Because <laughs> there are things that are complex. They're really hard. They're not too easy. and we, can't, we try to make them simple and easy, but they're hard. So ask an attorney. Describe for me the complexities of the new tax code. Well, that's just not easy to do in a couple of sentences, is it? Or ask an engineer to tell you about the Mars mission in a sentence or two. That's a little more complex than that. You can't really boil that down, right? You talk to your doctor and they talk to you about the complexities of the disease and the treatment options you have. You can't really get that on the first sitting. A lot of times we bring somebody with us in a notepad to take notes because it's a lot to it. Or you text your pastor and say, tell me a little bit about the meaning and purpose of my life in a couple of texts. Well, you know, it's complex. It's a little harder to do that. We like simple, but so much of stuff is mystery. And it's hard for us. We're finite people trying to grasp the infinite God who is divine. And so much of this God, this is a God who is spirit. Jesus says, worship in spirit and truth. This is the God who creates, who can walk on water, who can tell storms to be still. This is a God who was raised to life, who ate fish after the resurrection, who bore the scars of the cross, who appeared in locked rooms. How do you describe that God? And then think about everything Jesus said. Disciples way back then, disciples now, still have a hard time with it. In John 14, Jesus says to one of his disciples, Philip, I've been with you so long and you still don't really really know me, do you? And that's us, isn't it? Infinite God and finite people. We're told in the Bible that God has displayed something about God's self and nature, so you can sort of connect and realize there's a creator. But it's even better by looking at the Bible and the Old Testament, the law. God has revealed himself even more. The best revelation of who God is is in his son, Jesus. But even then, there's still so much mystery to it. And so from the very beginning, people have wondered, what is Jesus really like? What would Jesus really be like? So there have been all these legends, for example, trying to fill in the empty spaces between the birth and that one story when he's a kid and gets lost in Jerusalem, or at least separated from his parents, and then he's an adult. There's all that empty space in there. There's nothing there. So people fill it in with stories. There's a story, for example, of Jesus as a child who made some clay pigeons fly. That's pretty cool. But we don't know. Just somebody trying to fill in. What was Jesus really like? In the 20s, people started focusing on Jesus and said he's a great teacher of morality. We listen to the universal truths of what it means to live a moral life. People have said he's a great warrior for social justice or a soul saver. How do you look at Jesus? And they want to get to the man behind it in the, I think, 80s or, or 90s or something, the Jesus Seminar of many great biblical scholars gathered together. And they started debating the things they thought Jesus said. And they said, well, he said this, or he probably said this, or he probably didn't say this, and he didn't say that. So then they had these little beads you could all vote. So if you had a red bead, you meant he said that. And if it was a pink bead, he probably said that. If it was a gray bead, he probably didn't say that. If it was a black one, he didn't say that. It got pretty complex. It's sort of funny and interesting all at the same time. People trying to figure out who is Jesus really and what is he really like. 
But what is anybody really like? What are you really like? Are we really like what we're really like? I mean, think about it. There's a great Lutheran pastor many years ago, retired in, I think, the 50s or 60s in Ohio. And at his banquet, when they were having the big reception, he'd done many things, a lot of books and stuff. And they asked him about the highlight of his life. What was the, one of the greatest moments of his life? And surprisingly, he said, the greatest moment of my life was when Albert Schweitzer came to play and dedicate the organ at our church. I was a young minister and they asked me to turn the pages of his music. That was the greatest moment. Who would have thought that? Karl Barth, some of you read theology, he was one of the great German theologians. Karl Barth was very strict and very meticulous in his thinking about God. But there's a story about him when they're having a commencement service. One of his students is getting his doctoral degree. The wife has come to support her husband and they have a newborn baby and the baby their words gonna cry and stuff and sure enough in the commencement the baby starts crying Barth gets up from his faculty position in his robes walks down takes the child and begins to sing and write little little Swiss lullabies to it until it falls asleep gives it back to the mom and goes back to his spot what are people really like my grandmother used to always tell me this story of a guy who was invited to go have supper with the president in the White House and the wife said to him, now, you got to dress up, you got to watch your manners, and if they serve soup, do not crumble your crackers into the soup. And so he went and he came back. She said, did they have soup? He said, yeah, they did. Did you crumble your crackers in the soup? And he says, no, I didn't, but the president did. <laughs> My grandmother told me that story a lot. I probably told it to you before. I remember meeting Jimmy Carter. You remember President Jimmy Carter? Uh, I had remembered and known a little bit about him in the 70s when I was younger and I remember that I remember he was always wearing a cardigan sweater in the White House. You remember the energy crunch and crisis then? Turned the thermostats down in the White House. Everybody was a little chilly but that was an example for the community in the, in the country. You had to drive 55 on the interstate trying to conserve gas consumption. The Iran hostage crisis. And then I met Jimmy, Mary and I met Jimmy and Rosalind Carter at some Baptist meeting. He wanted to meet young Baptist ministers. And so we walked into this room at this banquet hall at this hotel. And it wasn't like, you know, he's up on the stage and there's all these secret security people and we're back there. No, they're just, Rosalind and Jimmy just sitting up on a stage. We come up, we sit by them, shake hands, talk for a while. He talks to us about our dreams and our callings and all that. I've met him a couple of times. It's really a deep man of faith. Pretty, pretty neat guy. Is that the real Jimmy Carter? Actually, at my seminary, the year before I graduated, his pastor at Plains, Georgia graduated from seminary and he came to the graduation. And people said you could tell the Secret Service people, especially in the choir, because when they had everybody bow for prayer, there was one guy, you know, he was looking around. And that meant a lot of seminary students were looking around too, because they were, who's the Secret Service guy? So, I don't know. When I started out, I went to seminary and I was working as a uh, campus minister in Jasper, Alabama. And I met with a group of folks there, brought up a lot of Baptist pastors, and they warned me. You go out to seminary, those professors are going to challenge you and they may even rob you of your faith. So you hold on to your faith in Jesus and don't let them do that to you. So I was on guard and I remember my very first class at seminary was Old Testament with Dr. Pamela Scalise. And I was ready for what she's going to show at me. And the first thing she said is, anybody got any prayer requests? <laughs> And then she led us in prayer. And I thought, I had never been in a class, a college class, a master's level class, where the professor prayed in our class. That's what she was really like. What are you really like? What are you really like? Have you ever thought, if people knew what I was really like, if they really knew what I'm going through right now, maybe they'd cut me some slack. Maybe they would understand me better. Maybe they'd like me better, appreciate me better. If they really knew... Maybe you've thought, like a lot of us have, I've got some flaws and I'm hiding, I'm hiding them the best I can. Everybody has flaws. And, and you worry, you're afraid. If people knew what you really like, maybe they wouldn't like you as much because you've got flaws. Well, everybody does. We're all sinners. What we have of Jesus is what we have. The wisdom of the early Christians was when we start adding on to the Bible in something we call the New Testament, the first things we're going to put in there are stories of Jesus. We call them the Gospels. It's almost like they're saying, wait, before you do anything else, start here. This is what we have of Jesus. This is what we have. 
And they're saying it's enough to build a life on, to build your faith on these stories of Jesus. John is one of them. In John's story of Jesus, it's a portrait really, he tells us many times how Jesus spent one-on-one -on -one time with all kinds of individuals. And the longest conversation Jesus has with anybody in the Gospel of John is an unnamed woman at a well in ancient Samaria. And because we don't know a lot, we want to know more, people have focused on this woman. What was she really like? Well, people look at details in the story. She's coming out to the well at noonday, the hottest part of the day. No woman would carry uh, that big water jar outside of town to a well at the hottest part of the day. We're told later on she had five husbands now living with a sixth man. And so people have said, we know about her. We really do know about her, don't we? And they've said, this is a woman of bad reputation. She's an immoral woman. She's a bad girl. This is the kind of person that nobody wanted to be around. That's why she's out there. And she's very combative, too. Look at the conversation she has with Jesus. Five husbands. And we all know what that means about her, right? We sometimes forget, in that ancient culture, there's no way she could divorce these guys. She didn't have any legal rights. This woman was property. The only way she could leave the man was if the man had first rejected her and refused to provide for her. There's another possibility. In that day and time, there was something called leveret marriage. It's a little odd. But if your brother married somebody and then he died, the next brother in line was supposed to marry that girl and that family to take care of his brother's, the deceased brother's family. And if that brother died, the next brother did it. So maybe there's five brothers and they're all... We don't know, do we? You know, we like to think it. We're really good at jumping to conclusions. We see somebody, we look at the cover, and we judge the book without reading the book. We look at somebody, we hear a rumor, a tale about them, we see one action, one snapshot of a person's life, and we jump to conclusion and say that's the kind of person that they are. We're good at that. The conservatives in Jesus' day said, you can't divorce someone unless there's been unchastity in there, to say it kindly. But the liberals, well, the liberals said, you could divorce her for really any reason, including if she burns your supper. Imagine. You come in and you say, I want slaw for supper. And she comes in and makes vinegar-based slaw. And you said, no, I like mayonnaise-based slaw. You're out of here, lady. Or she says, I'm going to make the vinegar-based slaw, but she doesn't put enough sugar in it. And you say, this just doesn't taste right. You're out of here, lady. He could do that. Can you imagine? He could do that. There have been people throughout the beginning of time of marriage who have split up. They didn't intend that, but it happened. They've divorced. My mom was one of them. She's been divorced three times. Can people look at her and really know her? Just by hearing that, do you know her? Do you know what she's really like? Do you know a little about her struggle of being a woman divorced in the 70s and at that time she couldn't get credit? My, dad, my granddaddy, a man, had to sign with her so we could buy the mobile home, the trailer in which, which uh, we lived. Do you know about that it wasn't her dream to be divorced and to struggle to raise two boys by herself essentially? Did you know that? I mean, do we really know somebody by a few stories that we hear about them? Now, do you know that she supported her boys? She was at every ball game we ever played, including the time that one of the boys made the most incredible, desperate uh, three-point hook shot in the history of basketball. That was me. I was trapped in the corner at Hoax Bluff's gym. Two guys on me. I didn't know what else to do, so I just heaved it up, stripped the net. The place went wild and erupted. My mom was there, but she was talking to somebody. She said, what happened? <laughs> but still, I appreciated her being there. Presence was important. And then sometimes we talk about people. You know, they're divorced, so we talk about it as a failed marriage. Well, that's good. Let's go ahead and pile on somebody. They're failures. That makes everybody feel good. Uh, you know, it has an impact. I'm a kid of divorce. I understand that. Maybe it's made me a better husband, more attentive. I hope it has. Life happens. It happens to people, sometimes because we make choices and we wish we hadn't have done it, but we did. Sometimes life happens to us and we couldn't have controlled it. It just came our way like a big storm blowing us down. We don't know this woman at the well. 
We like to think we do, but we don't know. We don't even know her name. Five husbands. Was it because she was immoral? Was it because she was a bad cook? Was it because she made the unfortunate choice of marrying a family with a lot of brothers who are <coughs> very unhealthy guys? We don't know. We don't know. And maybe she's just too smart. And she's a good debater. And a lot of guys don't like somebody, particularly a woman, who is smarter <laughs> than they are, who could outwit them. Now, Jesus, he didn't care. He could stand with her and enjoyed that. He liked a strong woman, a person of thoughtfulness and of depth. Some people don't like that. So at some point, maybe some guy just said, you know what, this is worse than the slaw. You're out of here. You're just too hard. I'm tired of losing debates to you all the time. The Jewish rabbi said, you don't waste education on women. And there's places in the world that still feel that way. You don't waste education on women. Jesus, a great rabbi, a prophet, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, initiated an in-depth, theological, complex conversation with a Samaritan woman at an out-of-the-way well in the, Old Test in the New Testament. And he didn't seem to have a problem with it. He started it. Now, he did that with other women, too. Mary, Martha, Mary Magdalene. He knows about her. We don't. He knows all about her. And he started the conversation with her. Somehow, Jesus values people that we don't. He loved her enough to share himself with her. And he valued her past and her present and her future. He accepted her personality, her individuality. Other people, well, you know, we see a woman. And we see a little bit of a story in a few verses and we make a big judgment about her. We know it's the hot part of the day. And everybody knows why she was out there by herself at the hot part of the day. Because she's got all these guys. And we know that the other women in town said, there's no way you're going to hang out with us. In fact, when you're around, we lock our husbands up. <laughs> we all know that, right? We know it for sure. John, well, we don't know for sure. John loves symbols. He'd say to us, I don't care about your clocks and your watches and your time. Well, it's noonday. I don't care if it's noon or not. But I tell you it's noonday because in my gospel, light always wins out over darkness. And the brightest part of the day is noon. There are very few shadows when the sun is directly overhead. And I want to tell you in noon when the light is brightest to shine on a story because he's going to tell us the story of Jesus. He's not telling us the story of the woman at the well. He's telling us the story of Jesus. He's at the brightest part of the day. I'm going to tell you about a man who can offer you water that bubbles up into eternal life so that you and I will never be thirsty again. I'll tell you at the brightest part of the day of a guy who knows everything about you and still accepts you. I'm going to tell you about a guy that we will call the Savior of the world. And I'm going to tell you when it's the brightest, lightest part of the day. What do we know? What does anybody really know about another person? We do know that Jesus accepted her. He accepted her past, her days of pride, her days of pain, her personality, her gumption. Jesus never turns his back on anybody. Think about it. His company, we call the church, has been letting in quirky people from the very beginning. Even here. <laughs> like you and like me. He's let us in and called us family, children of God, God's child. Wednesday night, I sat with the ladies that were getting supper ready for our fellowship meal. And there's some debate exactly whether we had rolls on the menu or we forgot to get rolls. Kim said, I didn't forget rolls. Well, so we didn't have it. We didn't have any rolls. And we're sitting there, and Kim's worried. She said, do you think we should go get rolls? Well, we're a little short-handed. And I said, don't worry about getting rolls. And that's fine. That'll be fine. And I said, now, it's not the same thing as saying people won't ask for rolls, right? Because you'll have somebody that'll come up, and they'll say, hmm, I wish we had rolls. A dinner's just not a dinner without rolls. But I'm not going to say anything about it. And some people are going to say, dinner's not dinner without rolls. And I want to let you know about this, and so maybe next time you'll have rolls. And there'll be some people who'll say, I want to have rolls, but really, I like cornbread instead. So instead of always doing rolls, let's have cornbread because that's church right that's church 
Because we let all kinds of folks in. And that's okay. And it's not enough to say, because we're different and we sometimes disagree and we're sometimes a little quirky to say, oh, well, we're in the South, we'll just say, God bless you. That's not enough. <laughs> or to say, well, she's doing pretty good, consider it. You know, that's not enough. Jesus has said, I know all about you and I accept you. <laughs> I love you. And we're his people. So we've got to do the same thing. Let ourselves be accepted. Let ourselves be a part of this grand family of Jesus's, And do our best to let other people who maybe don't know that just yet know that it's true. I love that episode in MASH. Some of you remember old MASH, the Mobile Army Hospital in Korea. And in that part of the hospital at one episode, there were Koreans coming for treatment. And so they had these identity cards so they could keep track of who they treated and so forth. Well, they kept noticing the same identity card for different people. They were just sharing the card. So they started trying to figure out who's who. And this one guy came in and he, they said, looked at the card and he said, well, this is the third Kim we've had this week. Can you identify yourself? And he said, this is me. <laughs> this is me. And that's church. It's full of a bunch of this is me. Right? A bunch of us like that. Some people say when Jesus asked for water, it wasn't just that he was thirsty and tired. It's an offer of friendship. Can you imagine Jesus saying to you, I want to be your friend. Give me some water. You get a choice. But I'd love to be your friend. Some people say it's like a love story. All the great love stories in the Old Testament happen at Wales. Some pretty girls usually there, and there's some biblical character. Moses met Zipporah at a well at Midian. Go figure. This is a great love story. It's a little different than we think about. Here's Jesus at a well with a woman, and he's expressing the love of God for her. He doesn't care. He knows, but he doesn't care about what anybody says about her. He believes in her, even though she's not yet ready to believe in him. Just like Jesus believes in you and believes in me. He saw something in her that a lot of people missed. A spark of faith. And I think Jesus sees that in us too. And thinks if I could just fan it a little bit, there's no telling what this person can be. In fact, later on, there's some villagers that come back to Jesus and said, a lot of us believe in you because of what this woman said about you. What's a person really like? What's Jesus really like? We don't know everything. We do know he didn't have any problem crossing boundaries. Boundaries of gender, of race, of religion. We know he didn't care about our expectations and he bucked them all the time. The disciples would probably have told us before they went into the village, we know he's the savior of the world. And then they come back from the village and they look and they see him talking to this woman from Samaria and I'm sure they got to thinking, gosh, he's the savior of the world. We didn't know that. That means everybody in the world. The world includes Samaritan women who've had five husbands, by the way. It includes people like you and me with our pasts, with our pains, with our prides, our joys, and all our quirks. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our friend. It's an amazing story, isn't it? Puts a smile on our face. It's an amazing story about an amazing God. I've often wondered about this comment in the story. The disciples come back and they see Jesus talking to the woman and they think to themselves, said the narrator, why in the world is he talking to the woman? But nobody asked him. Maybe they were afraid of him. Maybe they were self-convicted because you know, they'd just gone in town to buy bread and they come out and said, uh-oh, we forgot to tell them about the bread of heaven who's sitting at the well right outside their town. Or maybe they just thought... That's unacceptable for a great man like Jesus to talk to a woman like that because we know what she's really like. But nobody said anything to it because I think they'd started learning, even by chapter 4 of John, to let go of their expectations and just let Jesus be Jesus. Let go and let God be God. And that goes for us too. Let go of what you think God thinks of you and just let God be God in your life. We, what do we really know about Jesus? What we do know is good. I mean, what we know, it's awfully good news, isn't it? Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. 
And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep